Hello, pre-calculus students. The subject I want to talk about now is moving away from the pre part of pre-calculus and more toward the calculus part. What I want to talk about today is limits. We all got to know our limits, right? Well, that's not the sense in which I'm using it. The limit is really the fundamental concept on which the entire idea of calculus is, is divided. It's the whole way it's set up. And the concept of a limit goes clear back to the Greeks. So, for example, the great Greek mathematician Archimedes, You're all in physics, so you know the story there, that he jumps out of the bath and runs through the streets naked, yelling Eureka, when he figured out how to solve the problem of the composition of the king's crown. Um, he felt that things like that were beneath him. He did those just on the side. His math was the most important thing to him. He wanted to find the ratio of pi. And, of course, pi depends on the diameter of a circle with respect to its circumference. And so what Archimedes did is he took what we call inscribed polygons. An inscribed polygon means that the points of the polygon, the vertices, touch the inside surfaces of the circle. Like this, as I drawing with increasing lack of accuracy. Let me go straight to an octagon because I can kind of do that without screwing it up too much. Well, the obvious thing you notice is that as you draw a polygon with more and more and more and more and more and more sides, it's getting closer and closer and closer and closer to being a circle. Then he circumscribed polygons are polygons that are outside a circle. Boy, it's a bad drawing. Okay. As the polygons have more and more and more sides, they are approaching, they're going toward the circle. You might say the circle is a limit that these polygons are approaching. He would measure the length of the sides, the perimeter of the polygons, and compare that to the diagonal of the polygon, which is going to be close to the diameter of the circle. And if I recall correctly, he came up with about 3.14, maybe 1.42, something like that. If you consider that he was doing this totally with no calculators, no modern technology, pins, uh, drawings on his floor, measurements with such as he had, and that he was using a non-decimal based system, it's a remarkable achievement. Well, something like 1,800 years later, Isaac Newton in England And Gottfried Leibniz I think I spelled his name right. There may not be a T there. I'm not sure. Don't worry about it. Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz were working independently on what happens when you are dealing with equations where something is going toward a limit. Newton was doing this in order to do his physics. And I'm going to go crazy if I don't know Leibniz's name spelling. Yep, I spelled it wrong. There should be no T. Okay. Had to establish that. So... On the one hand, I did not mean to dislike Leibniz by misspelling his name. 
But on the other hand, he's the same one that thought this was the best of all possible worlds and was kind of spoofed for that by the great French philosopher, uh, the great French philosopher Voltaire in his novel, um, Indeed. So a whole, whole irrelevant thing, but hey, I know you've missed my digressions while we've been separated from each other. So both of these guys co-developed what we now call calculus independently, and they actually got into quite a row. If Newton lived today, he would totally have been a Twitter troll. He would have been all over the place tweeting horrible, awful things about Leibniz. He was a great scientist, but pretty much tank as a human being. And yes, Micah, that fits into your general theory. So before you say anything, I can I can hear you saying it wherever you're at. So anyhow, um, the basic consensus is that Leibniz probably finished it slightly earlier. Newton developed it in greater detail, but we use Leibniz's notation. Newton did something like that, which is weird. And we do this or that. And I um, actually got that reversed. But the notation that Leibniz came up with is what we use today. That's jumping a bit ahead of us, though. What I want to look at today is just the concept of limits. So suppose we had something like this, a function, fx equals 3x minus 2. And we said, what happens as x approaches as x approaches 4. Well, we could actually make a chart where we would have x and f of x, and we could start putting values in. We could say 2, and if x is 2, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 minus 2 is 4. Say three. Three times three is nine. Nine minus two is seven. And then we could say three point five. And if you worked that out, you're going to get it round off to eight point five. I admit I'm cheating on this. I'm doing this out of the book, so I don't have to do the calculations. But hey. One of the perks of being a teacher, right? Put in 3.9, you get 9.7. Put in 3.99, you're going to get 9.97. If you went on the other side, if you said 5, 5 times 3 is 15, 15 minus 2 is 13. If you said 4.5, you're going to have 11.5. If you had 4.1, you have 10.3. If you had 4.01, you'd have 10.03. I can fit that in there. Well, of course, we know. That if we put in 4, 4 times 3 is 12, 12 minus 2 is 10. And even if we didn't know that, it's very clear from looking here that on the left, as, as x gets closer and closer and closer and closer to 4, f of x gets closer and closer and closer to 10. The same way on the other side, as you go down closer and closer and closer and closer to 4, the answer gets closer and closer and closer to 10. So we could say as x approaches 10, f of x approaches 10. Or you could say the way we would write it, the limit as x goes to 4 of fx equals 3 x minus 2 is n. 
this is the notation that we use. And actually, it would be more formal to put this in parentheses. And instead of writing the word is out, we would just say equal. We write the word or the abbreviation L-I-M. Underneath it, we write X arrow four. That means what it's going to. Now, this might seem to be stupidly common sense. If you put in four, four times three is 12, 12 minus two is 10. Well, duh. So you're going to get closer to 10 from the left and come down closer to 10 to the right. Well, duh. Well, there's more to it than that. Suppose we had something like this. Suppose you had, suppose you had the limit as x goes to negative 1 of x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. Well, in the problem we just did, you could put 4 in and get 10 out and say, well, uh, obviously it gets closer and closer and closer and closer to 10 as you get there. It's not going to work here because if I put in – if I put in negative 1, negative 1 squared – is 1, but this gives me a problem. I'm not allowed to have 0. That is, as we always, always know, whenever you have a 0 in the denominator, what you've got is undefined. So, oops, what do we do? We can make a chart. We can say X. And we can say F of X, which in this case is X squared minus 1 over X plus 1. So we put in negative 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. I mean, I'm sorry, negative. Negative 2 times 2 is 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. So you're going to get negative 3. Then you put in negative 1.5. You will get negative 2.5. Uh, you can do the math on your own for this if you want to see it actually come out. I don't have the time or the space here. Well, obviously, when you put in negative 1, as we showed up here, you have undefined. Then you go over here, negative 0.99, which is on the other side of it, negative 1.99, and you get negative 0.9, which gives you negative 1.9. You get negative 0.5, which gives you negative 1.5, and you put in, <clears throat> excuse me, you put in zero, which gives you negative one. So this is very interesting. If I go to the left and get closer and closer going upward toward negative one, I'm approaching two very clearly, negative two precisely. If I go above it and I'm heading down, I'm very clearly approaching negative 2 from above. This is very close to negative 2, and that's very close to negative 2. So my limit equals negative 2. Despite the fact that at negative 1, it goes all the way to infinity. It doesn't even exist. It's undefined. So oddly and paradoxically, the limit of this. So the way we would write this is the limit as x goes to negative 1 of x squared minus 1 over x plus 1 
equals negative 2. Despite the fact that when you actually plug negative 1 in, it goes undefined. So you think, well, there's not a limit there, but there is. It actually gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to negative 2. Never quite gets there because at that point it would be undefined, and yet the limit is valid. That seems paradoxical. And actually it was rather controversial among mathematicians for some considerable time. Uh, the fact that you're going close to something that's undefined and saying you're approaching an actual real number, even though it's undefined at that point, seemed to some of the early mathematicians that you were pulling something out of your hat, or cheating, or making something up, or doing something totally crazy, but it was put on a solid foundation, and many huge numbers of things, calculators, computers, cars, engineering designs, things you use in your everyday life, are designed using calculus, among other things, and they work. So that proves that no matter how counterintuitive this may seem, no matter how bizarre or wacky or crazy this may seem, as with many things in math, things that if you look at it, first time seem to be just totally out there, nevertheless really do exist and have actual applications in the real world. Um, I'm not going to give you any written assignments on this um, this week. I will be giving you a packet that I'm going to copy out from the textbook I've got. I don't think your green book has the limits in it. I'll double check. I'll either give you some pages from that or a packet. I'll probably give you the packet as well. I would like you to start reading them, but next week, as I'm sure you're aware, it's spring break. So I will be posting no assignments, no tests, no, no nothing, or nothing academic anyway, on the website. I may post some fun stuff for you, music videos or humor or stuff like that. But that is all totally optional, not academic. Um, I hope this makes sense so far. It is a concept that seems strange at first. But like I said, it is basic to calculus, and calculus is basic. So much stuff in mathematics. So uh, I will leave it at that. I hope everything is going well for you all. I miss seeing you guys face to face. Hopefully it won't be too horribly long before we get there, uh, but we'll see. And possibly after spring break when we return, I will try to set up another video conference so maybe we can um, brainstorm and go over some of the material then. For now, uh, I will talk to you later and goodbye.